go ahead and start. Uh, this is Kevin uh, Kent is going to talk to us today about uh, the work he's been doing, helping me automate some um, processes for the book clubs here at R4DS. Take it away, Kevin. Uh, thank you, John. Um, let's see if I can share here. Not giving me an option for the window. Sorry, one second. I'll do it uh, by my screen. No problem. Um, all right, can you see the slides? Yes. All right, it's hard to tell which screen it is. All right. All right. Um, all right. So thanks, John. Uh, and yeah, I'll be talking about um, some. Uh, as John mentioned, some work. Um, I, I think a while ago, John put out like a post on Slack uh, asking about, uh, you know, there's various like tasks that we do on a regular basis that um, he was looking to automate. Um, so I said I would help with uh, the kind of video upload uh, portion of things. And um, slowly but surely, you know, we created a repo. Um, and I'll talk today about what we created. Um, and kind of how it fits into the general workflow. All right, so just quickly about me. Uh, like I said my name is Kevin Kent. Uh, I live in Beverly, Massachusetts. Uh, I went from education research and teaching to uh, data science and industry, where I've been for the last about four years. I worked as a data scientist on a DevOps team, um, and I've been involved in various ways with R for data science for a while uh, as a book club facilitator um, for advanced R and uh, uh, intro to statistical learning, as well as a mentor. Um, I also helped facilitate the user Boston group, um, Rachel. Um, and I'll be talking, what I'm talking about today was is essentially my first public package. Uh, so I've done a little bit of work internally at, at my company, but this is uh, really the first thing I'm putting out there in the wild, so. Um, so uh, for, for YouTube R, uh, there's a few kind of major whys. Um, so first, I think in general with any of this automation, we're trying to scale up impact and learning. Um, so, you know, we do all these book clubs and there's a bunch of kind of administrative tasks that go along with it to make sure everything is shareable and available to other people. Um, and automation can play a big role in making that easier and expanding our, our impact and our reach. Um, there's a lot of, uh, I guess what I would call toil, uh, the, around, uh, book club, uh, like video processing. Um, so, uh, you know, it's a good opportunity for, for automation where we can do it. And, uh, you know, with any sort of processing delay, it's going to be harder for learners to keep up async, especially asynchronously if they're, uh, not there live. Um, so that's the motivation. Um, and so. Uh, I don't know how well you can see this. Let me see if I can maybe make it bigger. Uh, all right. Well, that may I'll just keep it this way. Um, can you see? It's it? not bad. Not bad. Yes. Okay, okay. Yeah. All right. Um, so essentially, today uh, we have you know a book club that happens. Um, it ends. We have an admin that downloads the video uh, locally from from Zoom. Um, we upload the video to YouTube. We, whenever it finishes processing, we edit it, and then we um, make it public and move it to the appropriate channel with various tags and uh, kind of metadata um, settings uh, that are usually there. So that's what we do today, or like the kind of manual process. Um, so with YouTube R, um, we are kind of taking care of a chunk of that. Um, so. Essentially, uh, when if you were to automate this end to end, there's some pieces I think that we're still uh, having to intervene, uh, uh, do a slight intervention on. Um, but basically, mm -hmm. we have some sort of a trigger, which is in this case right, the Zoom book club session ends. Um, we have uh, like a processing step where we're um, I think John is using the Zoom R package interface with the Zoom API to download the video um, and know when when something is uh, ready to be downloaded. 
uh, and then and then we have this upload step, right? So um, kind of everything that I talked about in this area here, um, we we uh, you know is is being covered or, or uh, kind of try we're trying to add some functionality for using the bar. Um, and it's a little bit more than just uploading the video, and we'll talk about that. Um, and then, yeah, and then after that step, there's some sort of um, cleanup, and we want to move the video to the appropriate channel when it's done processing on the YouTube side. Anything to add here, John? Oh, yeah, and I also wrote in here um, Nectar, which is John's package for uh, kind of like API package development, which is really neat. And uh, I won't be going into as much because I don't know as much about it, but I've, but we, uh, I think John used it to provide some of the skeleton and framework uh, for this package. Um, and it kind of generates fun, uh, code and documentation from the, uh, what is it, uh, open API uh, standard? Um, is that right? Yeah. So technically, like, um... That that package will be Beekeeper, and I didn't actually use the package to do the the stuff that oh, I did. Okay. I used the idea of the package, and I'm using YouTuber to help develop that package, which is a major thing that I'm working on right now. Um, and then the other thing is just technically the the trigger right now is um, I just have a thing that's running every hour on the half hour, looking for book clubs that have ended, or other steps in the process that are ready to go. So. It isn't a push trigger so much as just, I just check to see if there's anything to go, but I have it running automatically now, thanks to this awesome. workflow. So, yeah. So it's like a, like a polling kind of like just, just checking every so often what's there. And then if there's something there. Yeah. Taking, um, taking it down. Probably ideally we could, like I'll bet Zoom has uh web hooks that we could set up that once they're done processing the video, we could automatically go, but you know, running every hour is fine. <laughs> so, so far yeah. that's working out. Great. Thanks. Um, yeah. okay. um, so in terms of YouTube R and what we've, what we've implemented so far, uh, we generally, we have a client configuration, uh, which obtains, um, refresh and access tokens. Um, so, uh, and John, you can correct me if I get part of this wrong because sometimes it's it confusing, but, but it, it's all very confusing for sure. My understanding, <laughs> so kind of the first time you authenticate with uh, with this YouTube API using uh, this client, these client, uh, this client function, um, you have to do it interactively. So you're, so YouTube, uh, you have to, you can't like authenticate with a, like a service principal or any sort of um, service account. You have to do, it has to be associated with the user, like a, a true uh, human user. And so there's initial kind of functionality to grab the, the, the refresh token from that initial um, interaction. And then, uh, and then we, and, and then it uses a refresh token each time to get an access token, which you use to kind of, um, uh, authenticate uh, and and do have a session and, and and do these various interactions with the API. Did I get that mostly right? You you nailed it. And okay. OAuth is confusing and complicated, so that's quite an accomplishment. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Um, um, yeah. Anything to add to that? Or... Uh, just the other step that we also built in there is you have to set up a um, a client on the YouTube side once as uh like an admin of um a, a google code space basically um and so that we also have functions or a function that just points you to the right place to do that so that you don't have to go searching around and we tell you know we walk through the instructions of what you have to do because it is confusing and just like confusing enough that between the two of us i think we wrote the authentication stuff three or four times um trying to find the right combination of things to get it right so yeah 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 and and i think this is one of the challenges that i was uh, going to talk about later as well as uh it's it's youtube doesn't make it easy to do automated workflows with their api so there's a lot of kind of workarounds and um a lot of uh yeah i don't know somewhat hacky things that have to be done in order to make that happen um, but all right. Uh, and then in terms of um, 
functionality and actually interacting, getting stuff and sending things to the API, uh, we have uh, functions that list videos in their status. So for a particular account, um, looking at the various playlists and getting the video IDs and the status of each of those videos. So what's most important in this case is knowing what the processing status is. So when you upload a video, um, it, it has to do some processing on YouTube's back end, and then it'll eventually, you know, maybe after, I don't know how long, it usually takes maybe 15 minutes, um, it says that the video is available and it's shareable and other people can see it. Um, so that's kind of that set of functions. And then we also have the video upload, uh, which we're calling, uh, because of the YouTube API calls it an insert, it's inserting the video to a particular uh, playlist. Um, so that's, these are the general functionality that, that, that are implemented right now. Um, and like I mentioned, uh, so there's a lot of challenges with automation in this case. So uh, we don't have any, there's no way to just use a, a, a pure like service account um, with the, the YouTube data API. So you can't have a, you know, a, a, an identity that you just authenticate every time with like some kind of client secret or certificate and, you know, forget about it. Like you have to have that initial interactive um, kind of authentication to get that first refresh token. And then, and then you're rolling from there if you were able to cache it. Um, but, but that's definitely a challenge. Uh, so the, the kind of second bullet's about the same thing. And then there's also some API request, request throttling that, that's pretty restrictive at first, um, but I believe we've gotten uh, uh, that raised quite a significant yes. amount, right? Yeah. Uh, well, we got it doubled, which is oh. enough for us, but it's still, um, uploads cost equivalent of what is it like 2000 normal requests, something like that. It's wow. so if you're just querying for data, the 10,000 requests they give you is plenty. But if you're uploading, you know, four to six uh meetings every day or more, like I think originally we could do four and now we can do like eight, eight or nine, and that's so far, that's plenty. Um, but yeah, I had to request to get up to where we could just do pretty much the daily uploads. Um, I, and in the other, in like my overarching piece of this, I had to, or I did write in a thing that um, actually there's a whole process that I, that I did to check for if we've hit our um, limit for the day. Mm -hmm. So I don't like, uh, don't waste my time, you know, like don't download this from Zoom if we're not going to be able to upload it to YouTube. Mm -hmm. um so yeah that that whole process was definitely something that, like just in in testing it like i when we were first starting we could upload like i think six times or five times yeah. and for the day and so uh then you have to make like it's not even it's then you make a new client and it's not that hard to do but it's annoying and so um having that limit raised is definitely nice yeah <laughs> I imagine on the on the under the hood when we're making those requests, H H T T R two and kind of uh, it's it's I think it's chunking it right into many pieces. No, no, it's, it's that oh. it's that YouTube assigns that that limit because oh. they don't care if you're just hitting their data API and just learning mm -hmm. information about the mm -hmm. the things, but they want to really um, be able to control. They don't want people to be able to yeah. upload ten thousand videos or you know, that kind of thing. So right, right, right. right. I can kind of understand the idea, but it, it was very annoying how low that default limit was, yeah. especially when we're trying to test because like, you know, of course we would upload five times if we're trying to improve the upload functionality, like right. that would happen in a half hour, you know? So yeah. 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 Um, yeah, I remember like in the first few days of trying this out, it was really incredibly frustrating to do that. Um, and and like a lot was happening. So I wasn't sure exactly what what the problem was a few times. And then I figured it out. Oh, you know, there's a really strict limit on this. So um, I mean, some of these challenges too, I, I still don't quite understand how like like, um, you know, with the challenges of non-interactivity and things like that, how a company, like, I know we said that there's like a, a Zapier plugin for kind of automating, I think, YouTube uploads. And I mean, just, it's, it's really, I'm really cur curious how they accomplish that. Um, I'm pretty sure it's exactly the same thing that we do because they mm -hmm. have you authenticate once 
and then they save. Oh, they do. Fresh okay. token. Yeah, that makes yeah. sense. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yep. Right, because it has to go to your account. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Okay. Yep. <laughs> Interesting. Yeah. Okay. Well, then, then it's not as much of a mystery. Um, cool. Um, all right. Uh, and then the long term, uh, definitely planning on implementing the entire YouTube functionality um, with the the data API uh, and. This will be supported by Nectar and the various, um, I know you said there's ne uh, Nectar, sorry, I can't get these straight, Nectar, uh, <laughs> B, some, B, B so, something. Uh, so so, so um, APIS is the Latin name for bees. Uh, and so APIs, my packages that deal with APIs are all bee themed. And the one that the, one that the API packages use, I named Nectar, so that's the one that will be imported into all of the packages. It contains all the shared functions that we're using across things. And then beekeeper is the one for creating the packages. So beekeepers like use this, it's a package to help you make packages. That's the one that I just got um, a grant to develop. So that's exciting. Um, and then Nectar, so both of them basically will be mm -hmm. using. Nectar will be the one that we wrap in the package to kind of abstract out some of the functions that um, basically the functions that I wrote in both YouTuber and Zoomer and the Sonar and uh, some LinkedIn stuff I've been working on and you know, all these different packages, um, they all have the same core set. It's just like, it's a little bit on top of HDTR2. And so mm -hmm. the stuff the stuff that I have to kind of expand HDTR2 to do, um, those we're going to have shared in that Nectar package. And then Beekeeper will be the one that reads the API and generates all the files for the package. So, got it. Got it. Yep. <laughs> cool. Um, yeah, and and like I mentioned, we were using HTTR two, and I before doing this, I hadn't had really any exposure to HTTR two, and it's significantly different in many ways from HTTR HTTR. So that's been interesting um, <laughs> to kind of uh, yeah. Uh, yeah, I think there's a pretty um, pretty big learning curve, mm -hmm. but I, I, I like I, I fairly recently learned HTTR2 as well. Um, in fact, you know, you saw some of these stuff where I'm like, oh, we need to do this. Oh, wait, no, don't yeah. do that. Yeah. Um, but once you get into it, like I think the the flow is so much better in mm -hmm. HTTR2. Um, Hadley's actively working on it, including he just fixed uh, something with the refresh tokens that is going to be. Um, we don't really need it for YouTuber, but for Zoomer, it's necessary. Um, so uh, I think it is worth it. If you are, if you don't know either, learn HDTR2. Um, if you already know HDTR, uh, you can probably get by. But if you, um, I don't know, if you're starting something brand new, I think HDTR2 mm -hmm. is the way to go. Yeah, I definitely agree with that. Um, <laughs> if you, I mean, it definitely is, you know, more like tidy verse idiomatic or if that's the right way to say it but um yeah. like with piping and layering you know different elements on your requests and um it, it feels it feels more natural at least uh coming from that kind of a workflow uh yeah hctr yeah. to me feels like almost just like a direct port of like requests in python um it's <laughs> feels very very similar um it's almost like almost like if you know how to do that in python you're pretty much going to be able to do it right away in HTTR, but um yeah yeah, um, yeah I, and yeah i think the whole thing where you you have the request object that you can just like layer things onto and the order mm -hmm. that you layer them doesn't matter because it's building mm -hmm. an object that you then use to make the request uh in HTTR too that's been it took a little bit of wrapping my brain around it um but now it is really useful because you know it just you can move those things around and if there are different things that make sense it doesn't matter so the mm -hmm. steps um like i'm sure that doesn't make any sense if you haven't actually worked with it but once you're in there it's really nice that you can say yeah. oh no no i need to add this piece to the end of the url and you can build the object that all the other pieces share um in fact i might change the way some functionality works because of that object you know all the, all the authentication all the pathing except for the specific piece for the endpoint it's all the same no matter what you're doing so we should mm -hmm. just build that once basically um anyway yes and then the other bullet very important 
<laughs> yeah, I don't. I, I've never done this, so I, I have to figure out yes. where people get or make hex stickers. Um, so maybe I'll maybe I'll ask uh, Dolly or something. Uh, oh, Dolly! I don't know how it would do. That'd be interesting. Because, yeah. <laughs> um, but I have made uh, a number of hex stickers. I'm not an artist, so um, other people could make. You know, it'd be if anyone wants to a way to contribute if you have an artistic eye um i can point you to some templates basically if you just search for um our studio hex stickers something like that they have all of their hex sticker svgs on um github mm -hmm. and so you can download those download an svg editor or find an online svg editor and use those as a starting point because they have nice like shading on the um, top of the hex and different things like that, that just look nice. Uh, so I tend to start from one of theirs um, and yeah, go from there. <laughs> yeah, I was like, I was like, it just, we just can't infringe on copyright. So, you know, yeah, with the yeah, YouTube uh, theme or whatever. Yeah. I think you can like, you'd, we'd have to look at what um, what they allow to use the play button icon for mm, they yeah, yeah. they might allow you to use it in certain situations but yeah <laughs> yeah um i wanted to put some kind of a, a image or something in the in this but uh yeah we'll have to wait <laughs> um all right uh let's see what else we have here okay yeah so i have a few things i think i've learned uh specifically at, i think from a lot of uh, john what you've contributed to the library because um uh, I think I, I started out with a, a set of, you know, functionality and then John went in and made it really robust and professional and uh, uh, added some consistent, you know, syntax conventions and, um, you know, function naming and things like that. And, um, and I learned a lot from that. So I just wanted to share a few of those things. So um, around like private functions and syntax conventions, so functions that you're not going to um, expose to the user, uh, you're not going to export. Um, uh, you know, John has gone in and done the, like, I guess the, the dot convention, right? Um, so, uh, if, if it's something that, that you're just going to use as kind of a helper function internally, um, that that's what we've been doing. I think that's based on, I think you were saying the, uh, the Google R style guide, right? Yeah. So the Google had an R style guide, which the original tidyverse style guide was actually built on. And then now. Google has a style guide that just says use the tidyverse style plus these things. Mm -hmm. um, and so at work, we just happened, I don't know, kind of randomly uh, found the Google one and the tidyverse one. And we liked that the dot thing for private functions because mm -hmm. it helps um, kind of remind you of, oh, right, I didn't mean for this one to be uh, visible to the user. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, it's, it's nice. Um, and then uh, something also that, you were doing that I, I like too is is grouping <laughs> related functions by the R file. So I think for packages I've developed like internally for work, I've always just done one one function a file. But um yeah, I don't know. I I, I like the like you look at a, a repo, you know, in a set of R files and you know it's like more thematic. Uh, and then you can look under under each of those, you know, video file and see five functions that all have to do with uploading videos or processing videos. Uh, so, um, yeah, just a simple thing, but I, I, I really thought that was nice. Uh, and then uh, the CLI package. Uh, the, so I, I, I've noticed that some packages from just using them have really nice uh, command line, uh, like return, you know, console, um, like error statements or um you know coloring and different things to make it you know really nicely formatted and um make it easy to figure out what you need to do differently um and to convey that error message so uh cli uh, john has started using here and um you know that's that's just i was grateful to learn that as well as uh to do r um it's actually really it's really hard to search for this package because you end up uh i think is it lord of the rings uh i don't know what that uh, there's a character that um, that has that name, and so I hit the right package at the end of it. But anyway, if you if you put to do statements throughout your um, your code in the comments, this will find those statements for you and basically allow you to search, uh, kind of skip through them and then see 
you know, which ones you want to work on and come right back to that spot without having to search through your code. And uh, it's been awesome to use. Yeah, I've been trying, um, I don't remember where I first saw the tip of having uh, to do our just like run when you open a project. So I have that running for myself. And then I just recently started to really learn um, to do R has a whole vocabulary. So you can say to do colon and it'll, it'll find those, but you can also say like, come back, you can say hack, you can say different things. And so you tag it in different ways and then you can have it say, okay, go find all my, you know, I'm trying, I'm in the phase where I'm trying to um, refactor my code. So find all my, my hacks and I'll go um, work on those right now or, okay, I want to do something new. So let's go find the to do, or I think idea might be one. So mm -hmm. I'm still, I'm still coming, um, coming around or kind of deciding what I want to use of their vocabulary. Yeah. Um, but I like that it has it. And, you know, all it does is it opens a tab um, in your R studio that shows you all the things that you have tagged. And then you can just click to go to those markings. Um, but it's been, I have been using it myself. Um, I think it beats my old method, although I still use the old method sometimes of just throw a stop statement mm -hmm. in the code um, and with explaining what I wanted to do, because then the next time I try to run anything, it'll break and it'll break in a way that tells me where I, where I was working. Um, sometimes I still do that if I want to make sure that I don't accidentally like, um, you know, Oh, I'm going to close this pull request. That's where I was. No, no, no. <laughs> if, if there's a stop message, all the tests will fail or some of the tests will fail. And, um, but yeah, to do our has been very helpful to me too. Mm -hmm. And that's a relatively recent addition to my how to's. Yeah. I wonder something. I wonder sometimes I code mm -hmm. in VS code. Does it, do you know, if it has a nice, like I know in our studio, it's a really nice, like, um, uh, you know, vetted, I, like kind of tab. Um, yeah, I don't know. Um, okay. I, yeah. I'm I'm on the edge <laughs> of working in VS Code. I, mm -hmm. I use VS Code at uh, my one current uh, job for a couple things, but nothing significant yet. But mm -hmm. um, I'm sure it does, though. I'm not yeah. sure, but I wouldn't be surprised if it does. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but maybe like a window or something that doesn't look as integrated yeah. or seamless. But cool, I'll have to try that. Um, yeah, I mainly use VS Code because of Copilot, but um, yeah. Uh, yeah, anyway, um, but our studio half the time. Um, all right, uh, and then, yeah, uh, and we'll go into the code in a second, and I'll just, uh, but I just wanted to say thanks to John for his collaboration, mentorship, and genius on this. Uh, it's been really, uh, I've learned a lot, and still a lot to learn um, from, all, you know, real expert in package development and, and API, uh, working with APIs and a lot of other things. So thanks to John for that. Um, and then uh, GPT-4 helped me make these mermaid diagrams. So uh, GPT-4, if you're listening, um, thank you. I'm sure the uh, transcript, the YouTube yeah. transcripts will go into training eventually. Yeah, 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 <laughs> absolutely. For summarization and stuff like that, yeah. yeah. Um, all right, and then I have some just some stuff uh, that you can find me um, online. Uh, but let's go into the actual package here. So, um, so yeah, so this is the package, uh, and we do have a book down website. Um, maybe I should just go to that. Um, and I think John had put this in the channel. Uh, and I'm, I was very happy, by the way, that the, uh, the name of the package, I think it's a perfect, I'm surprised, I don't think it had been taken before, uh, and it's absolutely perfect for how people name our packages, and YouTuber is like a real word, so, so I think it's pretty cool. Um, yeah, so essentially, you know, right now it's on a CRAN, so you just go to use DevTools and install it uh, via GitHub, um, and and yeah, so there's a few steps that are nicely documented here. So once you load the package, um, this will be uh, the that first step that John talked about, where you're you have to create like a, a dev uh, like a Google Dev like application, I think they're called. Um, and this is like uh, the yeah you need to, you'll get a client ID and a client secret, and this function just takes you directly to that page once you're signed into Google. 
Um, and once you once you have those, um, you just set your client ID and client secret. Uh, you know, these can be in your R environ file, ideally, obviously not in the code, um, or there's a few various other ways of, of getting those into your environment. But um, but yeah, that's that's how we have it set up. Um, and then uh, and then you know if you're interested in certain videos and their status, there's a few kind of uh, key functions for doing that. So um, so uh, we have a function that gets um, for a particular uh, set of uploads the playlist ID, um, and then once you have a playlist ID, this kind of uh, uh, gets the full uh, set of video IDs for that playlist, and then for the video IDs, then you can get the processing details uh, if the video is still in proce process or if it's completed processing. Um, so basically, usually you, you're going to want to, in this workflow we talked about, chain these together so you end up getting uh, the videos uh, from a certain playlist and all their statuses. Um, and then the last bit is uploading them. Um, so we have um, some functions for constructing the, the snippet and the snippet is just the metadata and information about the video that goes into um, that goes into YouTube. So the title, the description, uh, some options that you may or may want to have. So uh, I think the common one that we always say when we're doing it manually, you know, it is, it is not made for kids, right? Uh, so you have to say no on that. Um, and so in this case, you have a, you know, false, uh, you know, Boolean flag here. Uh, and then, and then initially when we upload it, it's going to be private, um, until we've like edited it. And, you know, I believe that we're still doing that step, right? That has to be done. I don't think there's any way around that. Right. Um, right. Yeah. By, def by default, uh, anything you upload is public and we don't want to do that yet. Um, although I'm trying to work towards a little bit of automation there that maybe we can get to where it goes public. Mm -hmm. automatically and then make then you know come back and edit if necessary uh but yeah we have to set that and actually a lot of what i'm doing right now is uh downloading the like the previous status and the previous snippet for for this club and building things based on that um i actually probably want to move away from that because um in case anything changes or you know things like that um, so yeah, but uh, we put these functions in that are so the API spec, um, the, the YouTube API spec has these schemas. For example, uh, video status is one of the schemas that it has, and so the functions are just um, basically just a list of arguments that that video status expects, um, and the, you know what type of argument they are. Um, eventually, I, I think through. Uh, what Beekeeper does, it's going to enforce that. So um, if you put something into the privacy status that isn't allowed, it would throw in an error instead of right now, it'd just let you do that. And then it would throw an error when you try to upload the video. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, the idea is just to make it so that you don't have to keep checking the documentation. All the documentation's kind of built into the package. At least that's yeah, the goal. That's really cool. <laughs> um, yeah. And uh... So are these, uh, is each of the arguments here um, like a parameter on the, on that API, like on the video status? API? Yes. Okay. So when you, uh, when you upload a video, um, you can, you have to include a snippet object. And I think mm -hmm. the status object is optional and it's, they are JSON objects uh, that have in the body. these fields within, within them. And yeah, you put those into the body. And so here we, we construct them um, as just uh, the lists, really. And then um, they get converted into the JSON objects in the body and when the video is inserted. Um, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, I guess I guess one thing that I uh, found is like um, uh, I was to had it was adjustment uh, because of the naming automatically from the API documentation was that like, like when I saw video insert, I was like, what does it mean to insert a video? But then, then I realized it was, it was what YouTube calls it. Um, and, uh, cause I think I originally called it upload or something. Yeah. Um, but I, I think, I think it's nice because you know exactly where to go in the documentation. Should you have more questions, you actually want to see it. 
Um, but, but yeah, I don't know. Like, I think sometimes yeah, there might be a balance between like human yeah. readable and like, and like what they call it, what the company is calling things in their API. But I don't know. So on all of the API packages that I'm working on, I'm finding um, either you want like two types of functions or a lot of times you might, end, or I might, I probably will end up making two packages. One is the pure API that it's, you know, all these kinds of functions that are named automatically. Um, and there's not really a lot of uh, thought <laughs> that goes into how it's built. And then either in separate functions or in a package that wraps the pure API, you add all the um, like human readable side of it. Like you would al almost be, you have, you know, like YouTube API and YouTuber, or you have YouTuber and mm -hmm. tidy YouTuber or something like that. Um, Cause like uh, right now, all the returns are, um, I think lists, they're not, uh, they're not, you know, they're not tidied. They are just the raw return. I mean, they're converted from JSON, but other than that, they're just the raw returns. And a lot of times you probably want it tidy. So um, there's that level that we need to do. And function names is definitely a big part of that, that yeah. these function names are very automatic. They are, they're built from, you know, like the underscores are slashes basically mm -hmm. in the API. Um, and uh, yeah, there's, there's some thought to go into that of what makes sense. Um, yeah. And I haven't, I don't have a solid opinion yet, but I will soon. <laughs> yeah. I mean, if someone's developing with it, they can always, you know, wrap something around it and make an alias or, you know. Yeah. So part of the idea is that um, by default, pretty much nothing will be exported from the package. Mm -hmm. uh, all the functions will be set up. But then the idea is as a developer, you then go through and say, okay, this one I want to export. This one I want to um, have under the hood, but I'm going to put a prettier function in front of it. Um, so that's the very general idea of it. Um, but whether, you know, like I said, whether I would recommend the single package or um, the single pure package, the reason for the single pure package is uh, a lot of these things that they're APIs. And so you're, they're aimed at doing something automated. And a lot of times when you're doing something automated, you want as lightweight of a package as you can get. Mm -hmm. um, and so that's where I, I hesitate to put like, you know, all the tidy stuff. The tidy stuff isn't as burdensome as I think they have a reputation for being, but it's not nothing. And so uh, if you could, it, you know, have one that's pure, it's just the API, it doesn't do anything really that pretty. And then another package on top of that that does all the pretty stuff. Yeah. That's kind of where I've, I'm leaning. Yeah, that makes sense to me. Um, <laughs> And and I think if you are a developer who's working on this package, like you, if you're trying to debug something, you want as close of a you know relationship between what is written here in this code and the documentation with the API. And I think and I think that's what you get with, get with this. So um, that's nice. Yeah. Um, okay. Uh, let me get back to. So so yeah. Um, I think, you know, in terms of next steps, um, there's a lot of those to do's and a lot of those hack uh, type, you know, all those different designations um, on, on the, in the code. And, you know, John, you've gone through and created a bunch of great issues. So um, I'm definitely gonna, you know, look into which ones make sense to tackle first. And, uh, you know, there's some uh, knowledge uh, building that I have to do probably on, on some pieces of this, but, yeah, um, you know, there's a lot to improve of what we already have right now and also expand, obviously, to the full set of um, the full YouTube API. And I, and I think at that point, it would probably make sense to look into CRAN. Uh, but I think, like, right now, it doesn't feel like the right step, at least to me, uh, just because it's very specific to this workflow. So. Yeah. Yeah, I think right now it's the proof of concept, mm -hmm. and it's... It's getting really close. Uh, there are some things I, I will abstract out of it because like I said, I was using some of my work on this to develop the idea of Nectar, basically this underlying package that um, is shared between a bunch of API packages. Um, 
and then uh like you know let's implement the whole api and then um at that point push it up mm -hmm. toward to cran yeah i see i'm just looking so, at the chat yeah. you, you said uh linking to do r to github issues have you done that in this or no the, the uh tanache said that i have uh, not done oh, that okay. actually so i was gonna ask oh, him sorry uh yeah, yeah. <laughs> i didn't even see that uh, that it wasn't you okay uh, so do you mean literally just a reference or is there some workflow thing that you do that's particularly awesome with linking issues to GitHub if you are handy, which you might not be, so that'd be okay. <laughs> yeah, I think you might not be able to speak right now. Um, but yeah, I, like I, I know I have done, um, I'll say to do colon and then um, maybe give a short description and just paste the link of a GitHub issue in the to-do. Um, that way, and and actually, that's right, I did it on another package where I would just put the GitHub issue number on every line, every area of the code that I knew it impacted. I'm like, I'm, I'm not ready to implement this yet, but I know I have to put some stuff here and some stuff here and some stuff here. And then they're just tagged to that issue. Oh, um, so cool. when you go to do it, it's relatively easy to find. Um, so, so how did you do that? Is there a custom just, to do our thing or, or uh, just literally, um, you know, type to do and either paste the URL of the issue or oh, okay. type the okay. issue number. Like yeah. there's no, yeah. now nothing I know of, mm -hmm. like there's a lot of to do R that I haven't really, um, learned yet. So maybe, um, yeah, so I'm going to have to dig in a little bit more. Yeah. We can bug cool. him in the chat. It'd be cool if you could make a custom like little tag or designation that just jumps to the relevant everything you've tagged with that GitHub I issue ID or something. Um, yeah, that would be awesome. Because it's definitely yeah, it's a it could be a many to one kind of mapping. You know, like one issue you could touch yeah. a variety of areas or, or every function potentially. You know. Yeah, yeah, for sure. I I definitely um. Uh, was it cookies? I think it was the cook. It was either the cookies package or the Slack calls package. I mean, sorry, Slack, uh, shiny Slack. I think it was actually, I think it was shiny Slack that I, um, it was the first project club presentation. Um, and I went through and wrote up all these issues that I wanted to work on and that I, you know, some of them are available for other people to work on and tagged it in the code so that I could kind of talk about this is what I mean. This is what I want to see. I haven't had the time to actually code it yet, but I know it goes here and this piece of code over here. Um, so yeah, I do find that idea helpful. If uh, you know, I'll, I'll definitely be bugging him in uh, Slack to see if he has any more specifics on ways to make that even more useful. <laughs> yeah, I'm very interested in that answer. <laughs> um, okay. Um, yeah, I guess I was thinking that. You know, if there are any, uh, I don't have a slide for, I guess I took out the slide for questions, but <laughs> if there's any discussion points, questions, uh, anything that's at the front of your mind, uh, this is pretty much all the content I had to present. So, um. yeah, I'll definitely, um, you know, anyone who has anything to say, speak up. I am loading up the, the sign up sheet for. Uh, the project club we can talk about that briefly but first you know if anyone has anything please chime in and i will say having putting this project club uh sign up <laughs> on there made me uh actually work on this yep. uh so that was really helpful to yes uh our next available slot is november if you have something that you like want to get done it's a great commitment device to just sign up Say, yep, I'm going to do this. Like uh, I was just telling Kevin earlier that I uh, agreed to do a, a talk for a user group, um, the Ghana user group next month. And I'm like, well, I'm doing all this work with APIs. I think I'm going to write it up, write up an abstract for Beekeeper, the, the wrapper package that I want to make that doesn't quite exist yet. And I'm going to present about that. So that means I need to make it actually work. Um, and so, that uh, talk-driven development, I am a big fan of. 
Yeah. Uh, looks like Oluwafemi has a comment or question. So go ahead. Yes, uh, thank you very much, uh, Kevin, uh, and also John, for this uh, uh, talk today. I think this uh, YouTube, uh, uh, my question is just based on the uh, the browse uh, GC functions uh, that will take us uh, that will take us uh, to the Google API where we can set in a credentials. So I do not know if you can give us through take us through a walkthrough how we can set up uh, that credential in R. Yeah. Uh, so you mean just uh, run in and show what it what that process looks like. Um, for, for setting yes, up yes. an application. Um, I don't see why not. I, I'm just wondering uh, with the recording. I I wouldn't do that. Yeah. I, I don't. Okay. Because <laughs> of the client secrets and stuff. Yeah, you have to click through to see the secrets. Um, uh -huh. So I wouldn't actually run the things because just you don't want to accidentally show anything. Um, yeah. But so when you call that function, you will have to set up an account on Google Cloud. Um, it'll take you to the right page to do that. And so you call that function, it takes you to the page. If you're signed into Google Cloud, it takes you to the credentials page, which is which I'm looking at right now. So it does work. Um, and then uh, you click create credentials on there. There's actually, I think there are instructions in the function itself. Um, yeah, there's a little bit of instructions in there that could probably be a little bit more detailed, but you just, you you go there and I, I hate to say just, I'm sorry, but you, you go there, you click create credentials, you walk through that. There's a little bit of confusing things, but do the minimal that you can to walk through that and get it done. Um, and then you, the main things are you create that client or you will get a client ID and a client secret and you want to save those into your R environment. Now, if you haven't worked with that, there's a file .r environ. You can use um, use this edit r environ, and that sets environment variables. There also you can also set them other ways. Like environment variables are shared variables between um, originally Linux or Unix processes, but a lot of things use the same concept now. Um, we recommend that you set them in that edit or in that r environ because then they are available to you and you don't have to think about them. The package will look there for them. Uh, and to set them, you just literally say like YouTube underscore client underscore ID equals and you paste in the thing. So in that file, you just set that, um, edit our environment and use this. We'll talk about a little bit about how you do those things, but that's the basics. And then once they're set, uh, the package will load them. You can also supply them directly, but just they're, they're not as secure to worry about as a password, but they're getting, I mean, the YouTube ones are pretty close because, well, no, this still doesn't authenticate you. Like it's still, you can't do anything with it. So it's not, it's really not that bad for someone to steal it other than they can steal our um, API usage. Uh, yeah. Cause the, those limits, those quotas are per client, which is that thing that you have to create within Google. Um, anyway, so you create those, you, you can put them directly into your code or whatever, but it's best not to because you don't want to accidentally share them. Um, and I know that's not a very good talk through, but it's, I think all we can do live on video safely. Um, I will put a little bit or I don't know, between the two of us, we can put a little bit more detail into the help for that function, like step by step walkthrough. That's what it's aimed at. We just, you know, we're, we were focused on making things work. Um, but yeah, the function will get you to the right place and then, uh, you know, go from there. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, th <laughs> and this was really helpful because uh, I always was always forgetting how to get there. And it's not easy <laughs> Me to too. remember how to do it in like the Google Dev. And for, like if you go to the home, the landing page for this Google Dev environment, um, it's, it's, it's like, a, it maybe takes five clicks to get to all your mm. client applications. Uh, and I guess the only thing, this doesn't really matter because you'd be the only one using it, but I think the name you choose there is what you see when you go to authenticate for the first time. And then it says, you know, uh, R for data science, YouTube application, 
uh, where you authorize it to uh, like I, for, I forget exactly what the words yeah. are, but but the but whatever name you choose is what sh shows up there in that in that prompt um, to give it permission to kind of I guess do things on your YouTube account on your uh, on behalf of you. Yeah. Right. And yeah, I will um, like. I think this was the first one where I I made that function, and now I'm doing that across the different packages that I'm like simulating building using Beekeeper, Beekeeper, and eventually we'll rebuild using Beekeeper. Um, that function, like as a package developer, you know, number one, the, you know, the idea is that I would, as the Beekeeper developer, I would be telling the API package developer, "Hey, go find this place." And log this URL here, and then I'll build a packet or a function for you that will take people there because that's a step that you have to do for anything, any API that requires authentication. You have to go somewhere and do that, and it's not a standard place. Um, so yeah, that's why I made sure that we built that in, and mm -hmm. it's now in my Zoomer package, and it's now in a Sonar and uh, LinkedIn. The LinkedIn package exists, but I don't think, I think I still want to make one because I don't like the way they did it. Um, so anyway, uh, all these packages I'm making, I'm, I'm making sure that function, you know, the equivalent function exists to just help you set, do that first step. Um, because you almost always have to do that. Well, so, so the YouTube client is what has the limits, the, um, if the quotas, a lot of times the quotas are per user. And in that case, you can just build one of these clients into the package and the user of the package never has to go build a client. Like that's how Google Drive works. There is a tidyverse client for Google because the Google Drive quota is not per client, it's per user, at least as I understand it. Um, they but the YouTube quota, the secret go ahead. in the package or how did they how do you get the, yeah, yeah. it's it's obfuscated in the package but yes it is in there because that client doesn't really do anything because every the authentication is really at the user level um and so there, there's a whole like discussion of they, they like i said they obfuscate it but it's just it's obfuscated in a way that if you drill through the code you can break it's not secure um, at least I think so. I have to be clear, I haven't actually broken their obfuscation, but I think you can. Um, but it, the, the point being that there's no reason to like, just go make your own. It's free. It doesn't cost anything to make your own client. Um, but for YouTuber, that client is our quota. And so, no, I don't want you to have our quota. So, um, that one's more important. You can also just, you know, like you can delete and create clients freely. So if it does get leaked, you just delete it, make a new one, and you have to re-authenticate and everything then, but it's not that big of a deal. Um, but yeah, anyway, that was a long tangent of, eh, we kind of have instructions, but we'll do something a little bit more uh, detailed. And some of that, like if you go to that page that the, um, the function sends you to, uh, it has a learn more button on it that Google tries to explain to you. But something I have found in all of my work with um, authentication, specifically on APIs, they're all written as if you already know how they work, which doesn't make for very good documentation because I'm reading the documentation because I don't know how it works. And it drives me crazy that pretty much every one of them is written that way. Um, so, uh, sorry, <laughs> and we're trying to make that better. Um, so this yeah. credential uh, URL that's not a part of the Open, a open API specification, like it's not like listed anywhere. Correct. And it is not. Okay. Yeah, Un unfortunately, sometimes I think sometimes it is in there, but it's not always. And technically, YouTube doesn't exactly follow the Open API specification, so. That actually helped me see that I wanted to break the VKeeper into kind of two pieces, one where you take the spec and turn it into a standard um, like set of tibbles, and then a separate thing that takes that standard separate set of tibbles and makes the package. Because that way, if you're not starting from open API, if you can still make that standard set of tibbles, you can still use the automatic, automatic pack, um, functions to continue from there. 
Uh, so, um, yeah, that thing is a, a piece of like investigation you have to do once to find sure. where the heck do they tell you how to do this. Um, and again, you don't always need that. Sometimes you just need an API key, but for YouTuber, you need a person. And so you need to set this whole thing up where the person authenticates, each different person authenticates. I just wanted to show, like in speaking of, I think there are some examples of really good API documentation. This one I particularly like, we do stuff with Databricks at work and, um, mm. And I just, you know, you can, you can like expand each of these objects and see kind of what all the components are of them. They give you um, a sample like JSON uh, request for, for doing this thing. And, you know, so each of these are expandable and they have a nice little description in them. So I feel like this is a really good example of, of, a, of a user friendly, like don't, they don't assume much about what you're, mm. you know, what you're trying to do. Um, so, and then there's human kind of readable mm -hmm. descriptions of what each of these things are doing. Um, so. And uh, they do follow the open API specs. So. Okay. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I think it gets you, it gets, probably gets them to do something that is, you know, like when you're having to follow the standard, like, um, uh, yeah, I think, I think it probably also signals that they care about people accessing it and understanding it and, uh, and actually using well, their API successfully. Yeah. And it's just, it's smart to do because uh, if, you know, the whole idea of open API specs is, um, I'm sorry, I, I lost, okay, there we go. I, I had lost track of a window, but that they're machine readable and therefore more people will use your API to do cool things, which is kind of the point of having the API, you know, so, um, yeah, so uh, that I like things that use now. It's one of those specs that it's uh, you know it's more of a guideline than a set of rules, but and everyone chooses to implement it slightly differently, but enough of it's the same that I think we can um, make things work. Uh, yes. All right, so I do want to go through. Um, or just take a look at, darn it, I just had that window open. Where are you? Right there. Um, I'll, I'll stop sharing. Yeah, uh, no problem. Uh, so yeah, the uh, next next month, uh, you know, next month is June. And on the 10th, we'll be having our project club meeting. And uh, I am going to slaughter this person's name. It's uh, Mio Min O. Um, will be presenting a uh, personal budget manager integrating Shiny app with MongoDB backend and Blastula for sign up feature. Um, I pinged them in chat and they are in Slack and they did, did say that they're, you know, ready to, or they will be ready to go. So uh, looking forward to that. Um, and, uh, you know, it sounds like a cool Shiny app. So very cool. Uh, like I said, we have room in November. If you really want to go before that, uh, I put myself down to, um, again, talk, to do some talk-driven development, but I can make room if someone else wants to give it a try. Um, if you didn't get accepted for your talk for our studio comp for something and you want, you still have this talk idea that you want to give, that's kind of what this is for. Um, or if you have something you want to practice or you just want to learn or you just want um, just a chance to say something or to get some people's help, whatever, uh, the spots are available. So. Uh, I look forward to seeing what else everyone has to show us. All right. All right. Thank you. Yeah, thanks so much. And take a look at the repo and see what you think and uh, give us any <laughs> feedback you see, you see fit. Yeah, awesome. For sure. And now I am going to say bye in the chat to tell the video to end.